the Clifford Brown birthday broadcast, which is coming up uh, this uh, coming Wednesday, this year's version. Last year's, you know, people were so thankful that we were on the air and that there was some alternative to the rep repetition of the devastation news of Hurricane Sandy. So we were doing our thing, and uh, the station functioned in this particular area of Manhattan. Electricity did exist. It was difficult to get here, but once we were here, we played you Clifford Brown. We played you everything. In any case, Elizabeth Leitzel reached me, and she said she's on the beach in Rockaway. And she's standing a few feet away from a man in tears whose home is devastated, whose world is ruined by the superstorm. And that she she's a photographer, so she's doing some freelance uh, journalism. You know, it was difficult to get people to go out into the storm and become part of the coverage of it. And there she is, and she contacts me that this man is in this situation. And, of course, she said, well, why would you call me? I mean, I'm, you know, maybe have some good Samaritan potential, but, you know, I'm just some guy sitting on a pile of records on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. She's out with a guy who's losing his home to the Superstorm in Rockaway, and it's not really a logical connection until comes the punchline. He had Roy Eldridge's collection. The man, uh, Kurt Schneck is his name, had gotten wind of the tragedy of Carol Eldridge's death and the shocking development of Roy Eldridge's super collection in the basement of the home right out there on 109th Avenue in Hollis since the year zero, and it stayed there until 2009. So, of course, the bottom line was that the collection was taken to the dump and it was gone. But no, this man had interceded and brought his own dumpster to take away the dumpster and he made his negotiation with the dumpster person who was working for the clearance of the, the property and he brought the collection to his home in Rockaway. So unbeknownst to us it had been saved or at least a significant component of it had been saved enough to fill a dumpster. That should give you an, ex an, an idea of just how huge the collection was and what an astounding mess it was in the basement of Roy Eldridge's home in Hollis. So it had been saved. It had not disappeared in January 2009. Instead, it had been saved to die a watery death in October of 2012. Great victory, huh? So you didn't die then. You died the other time, and you're still dead. It's kind of rough. But the collection wasn't completely gone. It just was waterlogged. This is not good for records, tapes, papers, photographs, drum sets. It just was really an unfathomable mess even when you were looking at it. And at this juncture, I contacted uh, the, well, we, he was once an exceedingly young gentleman. We used to call him the esteemed teen. And, of course, he's no longer in his teen years, but he's just as ardent about this whole KCR business and the arts that we represent. His name is Ben Young. And at this point, he basically took over. Using our station staff, we're all volunteers here and vans, the waterlogged collection that survived Sandy, that had survived the dumpster of 109th Avenue in January of 2009, that had survived the 20 years between Roy Eldridge's death and Carol Eldridge's death, was brought to this station and was like bringing the, at least the smell of the Atlantic Ocean and a good deal of its water, at least a sizable significant example and illustration to the station and every room stank and a drying process was at first burdened by the fact that and, and, and I've got this technical thing to tell you an acetate disc it, it's kind of hard to explain that these would be 
the actual cut discs, not the pressed records that were your 45s or your LPs, or if you remember the 78 RPM, but uh, the concept in the original form, carving into it. They're one of a kind. They're the recording format of the original days. And Roy Eldridge had a lot of them. And the way they're made is that the soft compound that's hard enough to stick around for a while, but soft enough to carve into, is adhered to a much harder inside, typically an aluminum platter, and that's the acetate disc. And water is not a good idea. First of all, if you put a label on it, the glue on the back of the label, and, and the ink that you wrote on the label, that's gone. So you don't even know what's on the disc. But also, the water can get between the acetate compound and the hard, typically aluminum, sometimes glass, occasionally cardboard, center. And if it's salt water, the process of destroying the disc and whatever its contents are is rapid. It's going to die anyway. Uh, when it dries, it dies, is the expression. Now, I was saying that to the press a lot in October of 2012 and into November. And so our first goal was that all of these saltwater discs had to be dubbed instantaneously because they were going to die when they dried. And then we turned to the stuff that was just waterlogged. And it I want you to understand the massive amount of effort that was made, and again to give the kudos to Ben Young, who nevertheless harnessed all of us. I spent one significant day at the very beginning dubbing drying discs as they died, and literally they would die on the turntable as we tried to save their contents. And I would say that, sadly, somewhere like 15 to 25 percent, somewhere in there, were transferred safely, and 75% of it is gone. But then again, in January of 2009, I thought 100% of it was gone. So the process continued, and an arsenal of people devoting their services have done their stuff, and it's uh, the collection, that which survived Superstorm Sandy, has pretty much been returned to Mr. Schneck, who I'm hoping is happy, uh, he said to the New York Times that, the, you know, imagine you're devastated by Hurricane Sandy and you've lost everything and you're, you're outside and you've got this waterlogged collection of jazz memorabilia that no one knows about, nobody understands what it is or how to use it when it's properly functioning. And now you've got to find somebody who can save it. And he did. He found us. And we did as much as could have been done. It's really amazing thing. And that brings us now to the music that you were listening to. And admittedly, it's now 20 minutes ago, 25 minutes ago, probably. And pretty close to the end of the restoration process, which was all but 12 months. It's funny that, you know, the, the, the real news world, this is, we don't really have news on WKCR. We do have cultural affairs and news and events in a certain sense. You know, we're about the art form, but, you know, it's a year since Sandy. What do you got? What's your story? This is our story. We played a huge part in this, if you like jazz, little jazz, and a lot of it. There's a lot more extant now than was here to before listened. And even though the real story is the tragedy that in a one-two punch of January 09 and October 2012, it was lost, some of it's been saved and at the end of the saving, we found these alternate takes from Roy Eldridge's first issued records, the Vocalion Dates. And it's one of the greatest things that's ever happened. It made all of the effort worth it, even if we hadn't saved anything else. And we saved a whole gang of stuff. About 50 pages of Roy's unpublished autobiography, for instance. Wish it could be all of it, but something. And we saved this. And if it was 1978, I'd be contacted now by the London Times. We hear you just played a, a heretofore unknown 
supreme record by the Roy Eldridge fellow, Little Jazz. And I would give them an interview while playing the, another record on the air. And this is not going to stop the presses or change the world, but it sure is great. And I got one more for you. Roy made, uh, it's really a pair that is one thing, but five days apart, these two record dates for Vocalion with his working band at the Three Deuces. And uh, on the second date, he recorded Where the Lazy River Goes By, uh, a minor key thing called That Thing, and one of his deluxe tour de forces called After You've Gone. And uh, I don't know how many of you have looked in the wax of Vocalion 3458, but it says take two. There really is a take one of After You've Gone. And you're going to hear it as the penultimate track in this largely, if not entirely, unnoticed miracle. The great art has been salvaged. An alternate painting of the same woman by Leonardo da Vinci. The Mona Lisa alternate tape. We've discovered it. I've discovered 105 new episodes of The Honeymooners. I've found an entirely unreleased finished album by The Beatles. And an extra play by Shakespeare. And The Lost Passions of Johann Sebastian Bach. and some extra copies of the Declaration of Independence.